my talk. So I'm going to talk about uh, PyLLVM, which is a compiler from Python to a uh, LLVM IR, which is an intermediate representation that Travis actually talked about earlier, which is awesome because I'm always also going to talk about Noomba. A little bit about me. I work for MongoDB, which is a document database that's headquartered in New York City, although I work in Stockholm. Uh, I'm going to assume that not too many people here are compiler experts. Uh, so if you are, then I'm sorry if it's a little bit boring. To give you a little bit of an idea of what you're in for, first I'm going to talk about how I got involved in the project and the very specific requirements that we needed to meet. I'm going to talk about Pi LLVM itself, which is sort of the heart of the talk. This is, in my opinion, the most interesting and also was the most difficult part. I'm going to talk about related work, like Numba, and then do some analysis and benchmarking before finishing up. Hopefully I'll have time for questions, but if I don't, since we got started a little bit late, I will be around afterwards. Plus you can tweet at me, you can email me, anything works. How did I get involved in this project? So Pi LLVM was uh, started as part of a larger project at Brown University called Tupleware. So what is Tupleware? It is a distributed analytical framework that uh, is, the goal of it is to allow you to write user-defined functions and have them automatically deployed. So you, as a user, supply data. Obviously, if you want to do some analysis, you need your data. Uh, UDF, so a user-defined function, which is usually a machine learning algorithm, maybe a statistical algorithm, something that is probably simple and mathematical. And then lastly, a workflow, so map, reduce, combine, et cetera. So there are a lot of distributed analytical frameworks out there. What makes Tupleware cool is that the goal is to achieve both language and platform independence. So what does that mean? That means that we want the user to be able to interface with Tupleware in any language they want, and we want to be able to run it on any platform we want. So this may sound familiar because we use a lot of the same tools as Travis does in his work. So um, how does Tupleware achieve language and platform independence? So since LLVM IR is an intermediate representation, which means that it's somewhere in between the original code, which for our case is Python, and the machine code, which is run specific to the CPU. The great thing about the LLVM IR project is that there are a ton of uh, projects that have already been done with it. So there are a ton of existing compilers to a lot of different popular languages. When I got started with this project, um, which would be about three years ago, there wasn't a great Python compiler to LLVM IR, and now there's a bunch of different solutions. So, that's nice. The uh, way that Tupleware uses LLVM IR is that the user-defined functions are compiled into LLVM IR, which are then deployed to generated and deployed on the distributed cluster for you. So it doesn't matter that Python can be slow. It doesn't matter if you have weird CPUs. It doesn't matter if you want to use a weird language. Basically, if there's something that involves LLVM IR, then you will be good. The goal of my project was to prove that you can add a comprehensive front end for the Tupleware project, which is written in C++, and when I joined, you could only really use C++ with it. So the goal of the project is to prove that you can do, you can add a language on top without having too much pain. And in this case, we chose Python. Usually I would talk about why Python, but since we are here, I'm gonna assume that we are all properly indoctrinated. How do they fit in together? You see the blue boxes are what the user supplies, which would be a workflow and an algorithm. The yellow boxes are what I worked on. The first box is we need to be able to call our backend operators from Tupleware, uh, sorry, from Python. And this we used Boost Python to make bindings and was pretty straightforward since we were already using Boost for a lot of the Tupleware project. Second is Py LLVM, which actually takes the user-defined function and puts it into LLVM IR. And lastly, we use the Python C API as a backup method since there are so many Python features and we didn't want to limit our user by what we had already implemented. So this is similar to Numba's object mode, if you're familiar. So I wanted to give you an idea of what uh, an interface with Tupleware would mean. Uh, on the right, you have your linear regression algorithm, which don't worry about the content. I just wanted to make it clear that it's sort of a simple mathematical function. And then you have in the red box how you would use Tupleware. This is pretty much the simplest thing you can do, which is just map a function to your code and execute it. If you go one level lower, you see that Python Tupleware library itself is pretty straightforward. The first thing we do is we try to compile the UDF. If that fails, maybe it's something we haven't implemented. So then we try our backup method. If that fails, 
Maybe the code that was passed in is bad, or we have a bug somewhere in our code. Who knows? Next up, we call map using the tupleware bindings, and we have a function. PyLVM itself, um, I'm going to go through the different features that we've implemented. Some of these features were implemented before I started contributing, and some of them I did. I'm going to talk about the different design decisions we made in the interest of simplicity, feasibility, and usability. Py 2 LLVM is an existing project that was abandoned maybe around 2010. Uh, when I started getting involved with Tupleware, I obviously, the first thing I did is I Googled to see if maybe somebody had done the work for me, which would have been great, um, and I got about halfway there. So Py 2 LLVM was basically a proof of concept. It didn't really work in the way that we wanted it to work, and there was absolutely no documentation except for one slide I found in Japanese, which unfortunately wasn't so helpful. Py 2 LLVM uses LLVM Py, all very confusingly named, but basically Python LLVM. There's only so many ways you can combine it. LLVM Py is a project by Continuum Analytics, which is basically Python bindings for the LLVM IR C++ builder package. This is what the LLVM project provides for actually generating LLVM IR code. Almost all LLVM IR compilers use this package. So because there are so many different Python features, we really wanted to hone in on what exactly a Tupleware user would be interested in. And since we determined that it was machine learning algorithms, we wanted to take a look at what actually machine learning algorithms tend to use. And the answer is pretty easily optimizable mathematical functions, nothing too fancy, don't really need decorators, that kind of thing. So we put that on the back burner, and we focus primarily on getting just functional code. So this is an overview of the compiler design. This is pretty straightforward, nothing too out of the ordinary for compilers here. First, you need to generate an abstract syntax tree, which is the AST. That is a tree representation of what the code is doing. This is where syntactic errors would be caught. So say you're programming and your cat walks across your keyboard, that's the kind of error that this would catch, unless you have a very adept cat. Next up is semantic analysis. This is where we actually analyze what's going on in the code. So if you have like a variable go out of scope, that kind of error would be caught in this step. Lastly, we have our code generation itself, which uses LLVM Py. So something important to know about LLVM IR and other intermediate representations is that it's SSA, which stands for a static single assignment. What that means is that you have your registers, and they can be assigned to once, and then they're frozen. So if we were to do a one-to-one -one correlation between registers and variables, we would have to require our users only assign to their variables once, which is not exactly a reasonable thing to ask people to do. So how do we get around that? We use something called a symbol, which is a class that has a variable name, a type, and then the memory location of where the actual data is stored on the stack. To keep track of our symbols, we have a symbol table, which is basically a stack of tuples which each represents a scope. This does mean, however, that the time it takes to look up a variable is influenced by how far back in the scope it was defined. LLVM types. I'm going to go through the different types that um, we implemented and basically talk about how we managed to take Python types, which are rich and dynamic, and try to get them into these very uh, static LLVM IR types. Uh, LLVM IR provides two numeric types, integers floats plus five derived types. And the Py LLVM types we worked on, you can see here. So because Python is a dynamically typed language and assembly code is never dynamically typed, uh, we need a way to be able to anticipate what the type of our expressions are before we evaluate them. So we have the type inference node, which does a descent of the AST and determines what the type is look by looking at the leaf node. So if you have a constant, like a string or a integer, it's pretty easy. If you have a variable, you have to look it up in the symbol table. If you have a function call, you look it up in the symbol table, but then you can also look it up in the set of intrinsic math functions that we added to the compiler. So numerical types, pretty straightforward. We have integers and floats. Booleans we added as basically the same thing as integers. They just behave slightly different in a couple different places. Also, this uh, was implemented before I started contributing to the project. The, with the type inference module, with every new type we add, we just add a new inference module. So it's pretty nice. Next up is vectors. Um, vectors were implemented before I started working on this code, which was actually a big part of why we decided to use this project as opposed to either starting from scratch or starting from a different project. 
The four element immutable floating point vector types are super common in machine learning algorithms, and we figured that our users would almost definitely want to. These are built on the LLVM vector type. So these are a bit more of a work in progress um, because uh, pointers to lists in LLVM IR require dimensions and other sort of meta information. It is very difficult to implement dynamic, um, sorry, efficiently resizable multi-dimensional lists. So um, these are based on the underlying LLVM array type, and there's a big asterisk that says to do this efficiently. <laughs> Another issue that we run into is that since this comes up in C all the time. Say you allocate an array and then you return a pointer to it, it goes immediately out of scope. So to get around that, what we do is we actually store returned variables on the heap. This is the only place where anything goes on the heap, and uh, we have to be very careful when we pop scopes so that stuff, uh, you don't end up with a memory leak. So next up is strings. Luckily, strings are lists of characters, and characters are basically integers, so we got this one for free. So for functions, um, you can define functions from within your UDF. We didn't really expect this to be a super common use case, but we figured it would be important for the people who do need it. The uh, function signature is generated by actually doing two passes, because we need to know what the return type of the function is. So first we go down and we determine what the function will be returned. Then we scale back and delete everything we've generated and do it again, but this time with the knowledge of what we're going to return so we can intelligently generate LLVM IR code. So this is another sort of asterisk. The uh, arguments are dynamically typed, but we have to be able to infer these types. And this is a pretty, uh, it's a pretty difficult problem. And the way that we've worked around this on our relatively short time, I needed to graduate, so I need to get it done. Um, is that we used the default argument module to sort of sneak in type definitions. This is the only place where the subset of Python that we um, support is different from how you would write regular Python. And this is unfortunately a reality for now, although we definitely have plans in the future to do more extensive type inference for uh, function arguments. So for intrinsic functions, we really wanted the user to be able to have a set of mathematical functions that they don't need to import a different library. The um, problem is that LLVM-PI, which is the wrapper for the builder module, doesn't provide direct access to the LLVM IR square root, power, et cetera, functions. So how do we get around that? We basically define in our header function um, we can import the class because it's done before the running um, of the code so that we can import it without it actually existing, and then it gets imported at runtime. This is functional, but the problem is that anytime you want to call square root, it now calls the header, which then calls the actual square root function. So we have one level of indirection. Print is handled the same way. We can just call printf directly. Uh, the nice thing about print is that this Getting print to work was probably my favorite coding moment I've had in my like four or five years coding, because before I had it implemented, I was basically running my code and reading the LLVMIR output and just hoping it was working. I could tell if it was seg faulting, but I didn't know if anything was actually happening. And then when I got print working, my like mystery executables started printing stuff to standard out that like indicated that it was doing what I wanted, which was crazy. <laughs> especially because I put so much work into it before I found out if it was working. Next up, uh, branching and loops. So LLVM IR provides pretty uh, simple compare and jump operations. There are some idiosyncrasies with assigning to variables within um, branches, which I'm not going to go into, but there are fine nodes if anybody is curious. There's sort of a pick your poison problem here where uh, what we do is you can assign to variables within branches, but you can create a new variable within an if else statement or it'll go out of scope. There are alternatives like Numba, for example, at least uh, when I was doing a direct comparison with it, you can't uh, assign to existing variables within branches. Now I'm going to talk about related work. The obvious uh, comparison is with Numba, although the problem is that it's a very different goal. So they use the same tools. They have, they're moving Python through the LLVM IR um, form. But the goal is to create is to make it run really, really fast. This isn't our goal. Our goal is just to get it into LLVM IR 
and then take it from there, as opposed to moving it through a bunch of different um, intermediate representations. Also, because it's a JIT, it means it's lazy, which means that it doesn't compile unless you actually run the code, which makes doing benchmarking between the two pretty difficult. Then there's the other issue that since comp compilation happens once at the beginning of your workflow, and compared to the cost of actually or, uh, analyzing your workflow, deploying to your clusters, running your algorithms, it's so minimal, it doesn't really matter. If we're a whole order of magnitude slower, then that's a problem. But if we are within you know, one to 10 times slower, it's no big deal. Bottom line, it's a much, much more mature project. Uh, I would not recommend you use Pi LLVM in production, but I would say Numba is a mature and extremely cool project. Yeah, I guess the, the difference is that we had very specific needs, plus we wanted to write something in-house. So I've all, I needed something to work on, and I always wanted to write a compiler to LLVM IR. So since we can't really do a comprehensive comparison in the compilation time, we can look at two other things, which is usability of the front end. We wanted to make sure that we did not create a Python front end for Tupperware that was actually harder to use than the existing C++ front end. And then we also wanted to make sure that the LLVM IR that we generated wasn't so slow that it made an effect on the whole deployment time. We used a couple sample algorithms. These are just common algorithms we anticipated a user would want to use. So for usability, as you can see on the left and on the right, they look almost identical, which is a pretty big win for us because it's not like Python can remove steps from your math and mathematical algorithm, but it can free you from worrying about memory management. The next thing is benchmarking the compilation time and the actual generated LLVM IR. So the thing about uh, LLVM IR is that the Tupleware backend expects it to be unoptimized, which means that before it becomes machine code, it goes through a couple uh, optimization passes that are done by the LLVM compiler. So most of the differences between um, the generated LLVM IR will be stamped out by then. But we wanted to make sure that we didn't somehow create unoptimizable LLVM IR. So we compared Pi LLVM with Clang which is a super popular C++ um, compiler that uses the LLVM uh, architecture. So we created, we used those uh, four functions that I spoke about earlier. We generated unoptimized LLVM IR, and then we ran them using and compared the times with system time. These are the results. Um, the blue is pi LLVM, the red is clang, the y-axis is time. So you can see that pretty much across the board, pi LLVM is slower than clang. Not too surprising, Clang is a much bigger project. Um, but however, it is kind of cool to see that uh, we could write a maybe a couple, like a thousand or so line Python uh, program that would create LLVM IR that wasn't like an order of magnitude slower. So this is the actual breakdown. Um, you can see that there's a big spike for k-means. And we wanted to look and see why was k-means so much slower than naive Bayes, for example. And the reason is because k-means has a square root call. And with our indirection, it means that every time we call square root, we have to first call our header, and then our header calls the function. So this is unfortunate, but there isn't too much to do unless we wanted to either reinvent the wheel and write uh, LLVM pi ourselves, which sounds unpleasant, or we could uh, you know, spam the list and see if maybe they'll implement it for us. But neither one. Um, has been particularly effective. And so for now, we just have a slightly slower runtime. But like I said before, it doesn't matter too much. So overall, the goal of the project was to prove that we could put a, um, a higher ordered language in front of this C++ library. And we were, because as far as the user is concerned, uh, all of Python is supported. And the Python that they're most likely to use will hopefully be supported using the uh, Pi LLVM compiler itself. There is a lot of work to be done. Um, and since I don't actively work on this project anymore, I work mostly on um, Python and MongoDB. I do some systems programming um, unrelated to compilers, unfortunately. Uh, and I maintain and contribute to a couple different open source MongoDB libraries. But uh, at some point, I would love it if I would have the opportunity to keep contributing. It's also open source, so anybody can contribute if anyone has great ideas. Um, what's kind of fun for me is that when I first did this, I tried to see if there were other people who had taken the same code. And when I three years ago, nobody had. But now there's a bunch of different repos with a bunch of different people who took it in entirely different directions, which is really cool.
So uh, there's a lot of people for me to thank. Uh, Tim Kraska was my advisor uh, on the thesis. And then Alex, Andrew, and Kaihan are the PhD students who actually work on Tupperware itself. Tupperware and how it works is an entirely different talk. And I encourage you, if you're curious, to go to their website or to contact them. Uh, thank you to the people who wrote Pi2 LLVM. I hope you don't mind. I've been mucking about in your code. Uh, also, thank you to my mentors at MongoDB, Jesse and Bernie, who have been encouraging me to go out and give talks, first in New York City, and then uh, getting wider and wider audience, which is very exciting. And obviously, thank you to PyCon Israel for having me. So the question was, uh, if you provide uh, Python in your UDFs that isn't supported by the LLVM compiler, if we indicate what about it was what we, something that we didn't support, or if we just ran it silently in the background using the backup method, and the answer is definitely the second, although that's a very good idea. Um, we can, since uh, if you look at the control flow of the actual uh, map function in the Tupperware library, we know uh, somewhere something has gone wrong, and since the Pi LLVM does throw various different errors that say, like, uh, something is out of scope, we have an undefined variable, um, it is possible to add that with just a couple lines in between using the backup method and trying our first, uh, our first method. So yeah, it's totally possible, but it hasn't been done yet. That is something that we haven't done. We just use the LLVM IR integers, and we use Python's integer class. The uh, precision, just didn't worry about it. Uh, the question was, um, type, did you say type hints? Uh, um, when Python has those annotations for function arguments. Yes, so um, we did, but the function arguments, since they're kind of the, in my opinion, the grossest hack of this whole project, were just done last as sort of a, a last minute, oh, we really need to support arguments, and this is much harder than we thought it was. So uh, that is something that we can look up, um, but for now, we just have like a, a pretty, a pretty ugly hack. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you.